Good evening, good evening and uh, welcome. Welcome to Talking Songs with me, Roland Jones. Um, I it always catches me out this, is that, um, I think I've explained this before, that when you click the button that says go live, um, the very, very helpful um, Apple Power, whatever it's called, MacBook, um, thinks it's a good time to actually explain to you what the word live means and gives you a dictionary reference. Um, and then you have to go and you have to make sure you don't actually, you click the button, but because it's written in large print in the middle, if you just a bit too close to that, you get the dictionary definition of um, live, which is not very useful to be honest, because I know what it means. Um, anyway, here we are back again. There's a bit of sunshine outside. In fact, we're thinking, we're thinking that when we've done this tonight, that myself and my good lady will, uh, will go to the pub for the first time, the first time in the evening in a pub for, for what feels like a century. But in the meantime, um, I've got Steve O'Donoghue joining us shortly, but um, just to kick us off, I'm gonna do a little song. Well, it's not particularly a little, but why did we say that? This is, um, this is called I Knew That Moment. Sometimes I think too much I look too hard and dig too deep Can't get you out of my mind Can't get no peace I know I can't forget you Though many, many years have passed I can still see your smile I can still hear that laugh And I knew in that moment I knew that's all it could ever be I knew in that moment That the world was only you and me I had to let you go Because I knew it wasn't right I let you walk out that door Didn't even put up a fight Sad or glad that it happened Either way it was never meant to be Thought I'd won the big prize that night But in the end the loser was me And I knew in that moment I knew that's all it could ever be And I knew in that moment That the world was only you and me Ten, twenty years later The memory still lingers on How can something that felt so right Be possibly be looked at as being so wrong And I knew in that moment I knew that's all it could ever be and I knew in that moment That the world was only you and me Yes, and I knew in that moment I knew that's all it could ever be And I knew in that moment That the world was only you and me. Uh, 
it's nice to get my lungs working again. Hopefully we'll be out there gigging soon. Barely wait. Um, so, uh, finally I've managed to get Mr. Steve O'Donoghue to join me in the studio. It's been fraught with danger, him not being well to start with and then being dragged into hospital to uh, perform his, his, his duties. So um, I'm pleased to say that I've got with me this evening, Steve O'Donoghue. Hello. How are you doing, mate? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Looking good. forward to a beer later on, I have to say. It's, it's, I uh... <laughs> Oh, hang on, we've got a comment in already. What's happened here? What's happening? Oh, it's Mr. Nev Buxton, one of our regular listeners. Hi, Nev, how are you doing? So, Steve, when did it all start for you then, mate? Music. Um, goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> My dad was a, a guitar player, a singer. Oh, so right. I suppose it was just, I used to see people around the house, you know, playing and, and have lots of equipment there. He had a Marshall stack in the back room. So Excellent. <laughs> yeah. I just thought every house had one. I was a bit surprised when I saw the people. <laughs> 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 yeah, you normally have Marshall stack. Yeah, exactly. Where's your stack, man? <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> so so, so I think um, I started writing songs when I was about thirteen. I, he always mm -hmm. wanted me to um, to learn to play guitar, and I wasn't interested. I just wanted to play football. And then right. uh, my mum, my mum and dad split up. And then when he left, I wanted to play guitar. Mm. <laughs> and he kind of couldn't teach me. I don't know if it's a substitute. It's probably some psychological bent in there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and then I just had my first band at about 13. And, but it wasn't very serious. There was a, I had a mate called Phil. who used to play bass guitar. And he used to mm. wear, um, his look was a Kellogg's, his dad's Kellogg's donkey jacket and a pair of his mum's tights on his head. I, washed, nice. I hope, you know. Let, let me let me guess. Was this like nineteen seventy six? No, 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 no. It wasn't. It was. Uh, we were we were a bit later than that. It was. Uh, I think we probably definitely took our influence from that. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it was later than that, unfortunately. Um, and then, but uh, you know, in that first band, we were so small mm. that we did we did some sort of. Uh, we didn't have a mic stand, but we used a, a vacuum cleaner. You know, a, a like Hoover, you yeah. as you do, which comes to about this high, I suppose, and. Yeah, we were tall enough then to be able to use that as a mic stand. So. <laughs> I, I, lo I love the fact you say, um, I had my first band then when I was 13, but it wasn't very serious. What do you expect at 13? <laughs> <laughs> it still isn't now. You know? <laughs> Unless you're Rick Derringer, you're not going to get your first hit at 14 <laughs> off. There you really, I don't think. Um, yeah, okay. So you, you started writing songs. Um, yeah. Where did um, you go from there? Got into a band. Um, as you do uh, for a couple of years, um, playing universities and stuff, um, thinking we were the best band in Ermston at the time. <laughs> <laughs> there was a great title, great title for an album. <laughs> Love it. The best band in yeah. Ermston. And, and then, um, and that sort of fizzled out in the end after a, a couple of years of, of, uh, of having some good fun, really, you know, up and down mm. the country in a band and what, album, what, what have you. And then I just stopped playing for a bit because I was a bit devastated, really. Um, mm. I just that's all I ever wanted to do. I didn't. Mm. I never really considered I'd go out and get a day job, sort of thing. So, but then I didn't. So I started playing it, it, it again. Um, about was it? I had about ten years off, and then um, started again with this other guy, just as a duo with yeah. two of us. And that wasn't really working out because uh, we we want, we were tried out lots of drummers and we couldn't find one that we wanted really. Um, mm. so that kind of fizzled one night I was, I was supporting uh, Nick Harper I think it was um, and the, the guy was in the this we were called Salvatore he uh, mm. I rang him up and said we've got a gig with supporting Nick Harper mm. and he said oh no I can't do it I've not rehearsed and I said well then I'll just go and do it on my own and, I'm, and from then on I just said that's it I'm doing it on my own mm. so I've been doing it like that since then you know mm. and, um, it's a lot it's easier been a, to organise isn't it it's, it's, it's easy to organise, but it's pretty boring after sound checks. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Develop this habit of drinking sort of lots and lots of Stella Artois or something before I was due to go on, thinking I had the best gig ever. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, brilliant. So, um, what about our first song then? Are yeah. Your first song, what's, what, what's the story behind this one? Well, the first song I'm going to do, because I thought I could do all the, what you might call the big hitters, but I didn't. I thought I'd try and stretch myself because I've not played for so long. 
And this song is called um, Vanity's Case. And it was, it didn't, we recorded it um, with some musicians at a friend of mine's house, Colin, Colin Wakeford, mm. uh, Colin Wakeford's house. Uh, I can't remember what year it was. And the keyboard player, uh, he moved to New York. Funny, we were talking mm. about New York earlier. He moved to New mm. York in the end. Um, but I just didn't get the song together enough to get it to, to put it on an album. Yeah. Uh, and what I realise now is that the, it's it's the song is basically about um, a couple who stay together through thick and thin when really maybe they shouldn't do. Mm. Um, and I thought, God, it, you know, it could be <laughs> could be a COVID song that all these people are going through these you know really tough times, yeah. I suppose. But it's just kind of like they want to leave each other, then they stay together and they want to go and they stay. And it's, it's kind of like that. One of those sort of volatile relationships, I suppose. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> he, he just loves her because she's so beautiful. And, and, and uh, he just gets on in the nerves all the time. But they stay together. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I think Love I was it. I think I was trying to be um, uh, Squeeze. You know the band Squeeze? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think you I was trying to be Chris to be Difford. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of. I was trying to write a song like, you know, I thought they might write sort of, mm. not quite as well. Obviously. Well, I, I think, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I can remember, you know, first hearing um, um, Cool for Cats mm. in 1980, whatever it was, and thinking, this is just awesome. Yeah. And um, I never got to see them until about 1977 or something like that. And a mate of mine phoned up and he said... Um, um, it's, this was in Manchester and he said, oh, we've got, um, we're sponsoring part of the Manchester Festival and uh, I've got some tickets for a gig tonight. Um, I've got 17 tickets to see Squeeze tonight. Do you want to go <laughs> and see? Honestly, it's really good. And what they, what happens if you sponsor a concert, you know, they, they give you so many tickets. Okay. And it was, it was a bank actually that had sponsored it and they hadn't, they hadn't organised who was going to get the tickets. And um, it, obviously the, the senior management didn't want to go and eventually it was sort of filtering down and somebody <laughs> one of my connections there went, yeah, I said, yeah, how many you got? 17. It's like, and uh, the thing I remember most about it was Jules Holland, who did this thing um, where he took um, the guitarist Strat and he had it on a, um, <laughs> uh, on a guitar stand at the front of the stage and you know how he always does this, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. He did that sort of routine and he was like, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are going to bring out the spirit of Jimi Hendrix from this Stratocaster. And he did a whole routine about it. It was ridiculous. <laughs> uh, but it, it was, I mean, fantastic band, I have to say. Yeah. Um, but I, I suggest you don't read um, the, the story of the band because um, it, everything goes perfectly smoothly for them. It's utterly sickening. <laughs> they're all great <laughs> musicians but like yeah my dad took us to this gig and that and that and that and it was like you know sort of the nurturing family the right contacts bing 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 and they were suddenly rich and famous um but no bitterness at all no i don't feel any bitterness to that uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so then okay give us your chris Difford song uh, okay <laughs> i won't tell him i hope, hope he's not watching now <laughs> Something vanished from your face the moment I walked into the room. Try to pick the conversation up, but it falls against you soon. So it's eyes crazy and voices raised. Pretty soon I'm yelling, stop. You just measure our success by the things we haven't got. Bands, bows, movies, every time I search for the keys. Eyes, I wave a white flag we're Well, I watch you gather up your face and walk around like someone I don't know. 
hard to guess what brought us to this place and why we can't let go. So she loves me, she loves me not. Pretty soon I'm yelling, stop. We forget to talk about the love we said won't be forgotten. Lovely, lovely. There's something about the, it's interesting, and you know, the, the comparison with Squeeze is obvious to be honest because there's the yeah. phrasing you've got in that. Because one of the things that strikes me about the, those sort of tunes is that they it's very, it's like somebody telling it, literally is somebody telling a story because the, mm -hmm. the sort of words you use are yeah. very much like this how you'd say it's not got that sort of it doesn't sound like a forced lyric. It's um, just somebody saying, well, I did this and I don't know how we got here. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's really nice. Good song. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Well done. Well done. Um, so, which brings me to the, the, the next obvious question. What's what was the um, what's your starting point for you when it comes to songs? Did that start from the situation or did it start from a hook line or a, a chord sequence or what? Uh, you know, when I listen to people asking this question to other songwriters all mm. the time, I think, please give the definitive answer because I really want to know what the, the secret is. Um, <laughs> I've been asking people all, yeah. all year, mate. <laughs> Nobody and everyone knows. says the same thing. I think um, I'm not one to uh, tend to write lyrics down very often. Um, I have started to do a little bit of poetry. Um, mm. There's obviously a big difference between poetry and songwriting, but um, when I was younger, I used to write lyrics and then, the music would come later. Now I think mm. it's just a phrase might come or something like that. And um, there's, it, obviously there are certain things that I think I might write, I might rap, want to write a song about, um, or be it, you know, it may be a political situation or something like that. Mm. But on the whole, it's just tinkering around and something comes and then the lyrics mm. will come later, you know. Mm. Um, I'm not, I think I said to you last time we spoke, I'm not, for me, um, the guitar. I, I remember Billy Bragg saying that uh, the guitar was a vehicle for his for his lyrics. Mm. Um, and he said, and that's all it is, you know. Um, mm. And I think, I think that's probably the same sort of thing for me, really. I think um, I'm never going to be um, the best guitar player in the world. Mm. Uh, probably, probably the best lyricist, though. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> so to, it was, it's two, two stories spring to mind when you say that there was a um, very successful songwriting team in the early 70s um, um, whose name I can't remember they wrote all the stuff for um, um, people like Sweet and all those sort of pop okay. bands and stuff and um, again it was the traditional sort of songwriter duo sort of thing and I remember seeing um, an interview with them and the, the the guy said to, to the one who was the, the guitar player, he said, well, I, I only know three chords. He said, but that's, that's, that's all you need, really, um, <laughs> which is very common. Um, but the, the other thing, my, my favourite Billy Bragg statement was that um, he said that he said it was very early on in my career when I realised that I'd never, ever get to say hello, Wembley. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was great. Well, it's a great attitude. I was, uh, I've been telling everybody who listen um, the story <laughs> that you told me about the um, the Delilah or uh, oh, right, yeah. home, whatever it was. It was. I just thought it was such a fantastic story. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, fantastic. well, he, he was hysterical. <laughs> he was hysterical, yeah. Um, do you think we should, t should I tell that story again then? Do you think it's worth, it's worth I think repeat? you should because I think it's a brilliant story. Right, okay. Um, 
Oh God, the, the name's gone out of my head again. It's uh, one of the, the co-writers um, of the, in fact, he died only recently. I think that's probably why he was in the forefront of my mind when we were talking. Um, he died recently. He was the um, the lyricist who and worked with the other guy and they did, they wrote things like um, Green Green Grass of Home and um, Delilah and all those sort of things, all, all the Tom Jones big hits. And um, he was saying that he was in the uh, the BBC club celebrating, they just hit number one. And the two of them were in there getting, getting rat ass basically and celebrating wildly. And the guy who was the, uh, who was, was telling the story went into the, into the loo and he's, he's there doing what he needs to do. And bloke walks in alongside him, does the same and starts whistling their number one tune. And uh, he says, I wrote that. And the bloke says, I thought, I thought Les Reed wrote that. He said, yeah, but I wrote the lyrics. And the bloke said, I'm not whistling your lyrics. And <laughs> walked out. It's just, <laughs> it's wonderful, isn't it? It's a cracking story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um <laughs> how, how do we follow that <laughs> yeah um yeah he was very really funny he also said that in the when i saw him he was talking about um writing partnerships and somebody asked the question what do you feel about uh, you know collaborating because you've always collaborated and he said um I think you should always collaborate. He said, it's better to have 50% of something rather than 100% of fuck all. <laughs> and, and he left it at that. And that, that, was, his, that was his sole idea, right? <laughs> which I think was good. But coming back to, to your songwriting, I mean, the thing is that there are, there are people write in different ways, mm. obviously. But one of the things that fascinates me is people like um, Carol King and those people who started off you know, working in, in the Brill building and churning out a song every day. Yeah. You know, and then if they got the end of the day and didn't like it, they started starting something new and starting on something new the following day, whether they liked it or not, because that was what yeah. their job was. And um, I don't know many people who these days work like that. I mean, maybe when you get into the, the, the realms of, of, of pop music per se, and you've got like six people in the room trying to put something together, I don't think there's many songs. Although I, I do know that, that, that Ben Williams, who's a, a local songwriter, when it, the first lockdown, um, he, he boldly said he was going to write a song a day for the first month, and he did. Right. And he, he posted them every day, and he's a good songwriter, and they were yeah, good yeah, songs. Yeah. And I was, I was envious of his determination after saying Because <laughs> most of us were nowhere near that. Nowhere near well, that. do you know what, Roland? I think um, a while back, about from about the year 2000 i was doing a lot of acoustic sort of gigs hmm. they weren't open mics as such they would it was a called um acoustica it was something that darren poiser had put together all oh, right yeah. and four or five acts would go all over the place playing these gigs and um i met some absolutely wonderful people there hmm. um but what would kind of inspire me in that respect is someone go up one night and do a brilliant song hmm. and you'd think that was fantastic. You know, mm. that was, I want to write something like that. I wanna, mm. And that for a long time, and still now I think when you hear other musicians writing stuff, I think that's mm. the thing that probably inspires me to try and dig out something a bit, a bit better, not the better mm. than them, but a bit better than what I'm doing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, but and, uh, that, that, cool. that period of time, that acoustic, that was when uh, there was just, there was people like Darren and, and George Borofsky um, yeah. playing and, and, well, they were the two. They were the two people who introduced me to you. <laughs> oh right, okay. I'm the son. Believe but it or not. Uh, <laughs> um, but there was there was there was loads. There was a guy called Tony Orton who was fantastic, and Colin and Wakeford and, and Dave Gordon, and all these people. Uh, Kirk McElhenney. Um They were just. It was just brilliant to go and watch these people mm. every night um, in in different in you know dives all over the northwest, but doing this great oh, yeah. stuff, and that's. That, I still, like I say, I still find that it's difficult when you're in that sort of presence of people who are writing such great songs to uh, to not be inspired by it. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, as I spoke to you the other week and I said that I've not done anything under lockdown, mm. I think potentially that might be one of the reasons why, because I've not been out watching other people, which I really sort yes. of get off on that sort of turns me on, do you know what I mean? Definitely. Well, I, I, as, I mean, doing this, I've spoken to 
um, about about 50 different writers and most of them have said that they've not been as productive in this year as they thought they could have been mm -hmm. um, I mean a lot of I mean some people like if they're actually functioning bands or duos or whatever um, have got have got things done but that's mainly because they were there was more than one of them but the people yeah. who are working on their own have tended to, to feel a bit of oh, don't know what yeah. to do with myself sort of thing uh -huh. uh, and then the, the weird thing i i um i i've i've always well not always for for, for a long long time like 20 years now i've all, i've kept a notebook and i it's it's not just songs in it but all sorts of stuff and i'm just getting to the end of this one and i went back through it the other day and i discovered nine songs in there oh, or wow. nine bits of songs i yeah. mean complete com complete lyrics for two or three of them yeah except for the last line of the verse or whatever you know and and, yeah. and i thought well I, I think i've done nothing but in fact what i've done is it's like i'd be a useless builder because there'd be foundations everywhere but sod all <laughs> above it you know um but i i think the the just the the incentive of two weeks ago and actually going out and doing a gig um, yeah. which is the first one i've done since last march was actually quite you know quite stimulating yeah. So hopefully now that things are starting to loosen up a bit, we'll all, we'll all get out there more. And because um, I think you just you just you just if you don't have interaction with other people, there's nothing going yeah. through your head apart from yet another box set that you were watching. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And I'm um, I'm one of those people. I, I don't feel very comfortable talking hmm. through uh, electronic equipment. Really, um, mm. give me a megaphone any day. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I just so I've, I've kind of tended to shy away from a lot of stuff and even mm. friends saying you know should we have a a, a, a meeting through whatever mm. and I've sort of said oh no, you know I don't I don't know really and so I, I, I've become quite the, the recluse recently I yeah think. but um but did you enjoy it playing was it was it was it nerve were you nervous or the f I was really looking forward to it. it was an afternoon gig we did it in Stockport me and Bo do you know Bo Bo Lee yeah Olive from um our conversation Legend. yeah <laughs> Um, and uh, we got there and um, it was a lot of nervous first of all it was the first Saturday after the pubs had opened so we thought it might be a bit a little bit raucous shall we say but it wasn't it was actually really nice and the, the, uh -huh. the, the place with the the area because it was sort of blocked out um, was 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 full um, they were nice punters they enjoyed what we did but Bo and I was were chatting after the first set and we both agreed that the first three or four numbers just felt weird <laughs> because even though, you know, we he, obviously he'd been playing at yeah. home, I'd been playing at home, to suddenly be next to somebody and actually yeah. playing and, and bouncing off each other was quite, it, it was like a new experience really. <laughs> um, there, were, there were a few dodgy moments. There was, because I, I don't know, I try not to work with lyric sheets in front of me, but I thought, I've got a reasonable excuse not having a gig for a year. So I took everything with me. And there was one song. I said, what about this? And he went, uh, um, yeah, yeah, OK, OK. And he played the, the, the groove on it. And I just went blank. <laughs> and it was a song I'd written. And I said, well, what? I, I don't know what I do. So very, very quickly, <laughs> I'm going, dun, 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 and the chorus goes, dun, 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 dun. And, oh, OK, fine. And then we started it. But it's just complete blank, you know, utterly yeah. helpless. Um, luckily, everybody was drinking and they weren't bothered anyway, so that was all right. But it, it was good fun, but it was strange to begin with. And, uh, yeah, we, we did, like, you know, three 45-minute sets or something, and then it was just lovely to do. And yeah. hopefully there'll be more on, the, uh, more on the horizon. Yeah. Um, so what about song number two, then, you reckon? Well, I've not played this before, so it's a, well, it's a new right. thing. What I thought was, if I forget the words, or I get it wrong, I'll just... I'm <laughs> frozen. So I think what I've got to do. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll be... Um, it won't be one of those. Whenever you freeze, usually, it's kind of like a... Isn't it? Yeah. You know I mean? that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the worst possible thing. Um, <laughs> this is the first song I've co-written for... Um, uh, well, forever... Uh, <laughs> and so it's about in a teenagers in a band. Uh, I did some uh, shows with a guy called Tony Kinsella, um, uh, who's a poet, and yeah. uh, he wrote a song. He wrote some stuff, a show about the Undertones, the band the Undertones. So we went to, to Ireland 
right. to play. Um, and uh, the under, I was playing the undertone songs, and the undertones were in the audience. It was the, it was the freakiest thing ever. Uh, it was pretty uh, intimidating, I suppose. But um, we got this song. Um, it's it's typical of me, really. I right. should work for the government because right. it's about the <laughs> lockdown. Right. Um, but mainly at the very first lockdown when when the streets were empty and stuff. And now now it's all back to normal. I've decided to start doing the song. It's just it's just ridiculous, really. Do you know what I mean? The time. <laughs> well, as but, you say, uh, you're, work, you're go. working as quickly as they did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I um if I forget it, I don't know. We'll see anyway. So it's called. Um, you shouldn't have told us. We wouldn't have known. <laughs> no, I, well. <laughs> I yeah. like that. You see, you, you can't do that when you're live, can you? you can't no, exactly. Yeah. Freeze on stage. <laughs> hmm. uh, yeah, only goes to Rome in this call. I'm peering through the diamond curtains onto a future so uncertain. I'm burdened by my fear of what will be. Down below me, the streets deserted, cold and lonely, and strangely furtive. This in this world of comfortability. No pizza pads or a tiny feet, no place to be alone in. A dark network of empty streets where only ghosts. A masquerade of grotesque dancers, a pale parade of necromancers, all searching for an answer in the blue. Doppelganger in the darkness, thin and thankless, drifting heartless, sifting through the secrets of their truths. No bits of pats or tiny feet, no place to be alone in. A damp network of empty streets where only ghosts are roaming. Senses never leave, the air is often free. Their mask is slipping. Calmly dismissing the price we have to pay. No bits of pass or tiny things. No place to be alone in. A damp network of empty streets where only goes to roaming. Only goes to roaming. Great. Well, I, I have to say, great admiration for you getting the words doppelgangers and necromancers into a song. That's that's yeah. pretty impressive. It's, pretty uh, impressive. It's it's, it's um, it certainly aids with the helping of. <laughs> do you know what I mean? If it was rhyming, baby and maybe I'd never get there. Yeah. Well, it's quite interesting because I was talking to somebody about this the other day about uh, about rhyming dictionaries. Oh yeah. And oh, I, I was... saw a bit of that. Oh, did you? Yeah. What, what? Well, this wasn't live. This was this oh. was me having a chat with somebody. I might what? actually, I might have spoken to somebody about it. No, I think last night you were talking. I assumed I've just checked in, and you were talking about. Uh, and you said that on page two there were two word rhymes. On page two, the oh yes. I just assume that's what you were talking about. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Oh, that's true. I I've forgotten. I I talked about it last night as well. Um, but yeah, it's just this idea of rhyming, not just the end syllable. Mm. But it's rhyming the the uh, like a secondary rhyme. So you've got um, dancers, romances. Um, yeah. Well, uh, did you uh, watch? Did you watch that program on BBC Four this week about uh, how pop songs are made? No, no. What was it? Or called? how pop songs are written? If you can get it, it's on BBC Four. Right. Really, really interesting. Absolutely fantastic. It was just, it was, it was mesmerising. But what they were saying on that was. A lot of that kind of word rhyming is, mm. is taken from hip hop, you know, 
right. the, the rhyme and the words the way you were talking about them because yeah. um, it's it's very quick and the very way they do the way they do it mm. is, is in that kind of vein and it, it, honestly I can recommend that program. It's so I'll good. check that out. I mean, the, yeah. the thing for me is is that you also get it on, in if you go back to. Um, like the, the great American songbook and all those sort of writers, they quite often do those things where they'll yeah. um, use double syllable rhymes as it were, but also um, rhyming within the line. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, you've, I do. you've got the, you've got the end word rhyming or, you know, one and three, two and four, whatever. Yeah. But also you've got two words in the middle of the song, which still have the same rhythmic sound to them. Uh -huh. Which yeah. I think is quite quite interesting. I mean, well, I'm quite a words. fan of Cole Porter, really, and I think that Cole Porter is probably one of the best, you know. Yeah. Um, for me, anyway. Um, so it's kind of I've always not not so much listened to uh, lyricists that will be clever for mm. the sake of it mm. as such, because you can get that, but mm. just really really clever stuff you know that you sort of you think oh my god I, yeah you know you get it and it and it and it sort of the bell yeah. rings and you think i wish i'd done i wish i'd have thought of that i love that i love i love it and, it, and it's the great thing about that is it's you, you see that a lot when you're out when you're playing locally when mm. people are playing because um just because these people are only playing to rooms of 20 or 30 people doesn't mean they're not great songwriters do you know what i mean mm. and just hear some really good stuff sometimes mm. and uh but yeah, I I think think I, the saying about the, 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 the that era, the whole great American songbook thing. Yeah. One of the things I love is that um, every time we say goodbye, where the, the line is, and how strange the change from major to yeah. minor, where it actually goes from a minor chord to a major chord. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. the melody yeah. goes one way and the words yeah. go the other. Yeah. I mean, that is, that's just genius, isn't it? Isn't but it? The, the other story that, that I, I like is, is the, um, and I can't think of who it was who wrote it, um, but um, I think it was written in the twenties. Is this is the song um, uh, that that is titled "I'll Be Loving You Always," right? And yeah. the chorus lines, "I'll Be Loving You All." Da, 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 da. Yeah. Well, apparently, whoever it was wrote it struggled with the word "always" for about right. a year. Okay. So I don't know what what, what variations he went through. I mean, I'll be loving you for a long time, or till the, <laughs> t till the end of the week, <laughs> or, or whatever. But it took me a year. And, and when you hear it, it's it's so obvious, isn't it, that it's the right uh, word? Yeah. And, and yet he struggled with it. Right. And I I find that quite fascinating. Um, yeah. I'm. Uh, cool. Sorry, I was going to say. I for me, I think I think the thing I and I've, I don't know about yourself, but. The thing I can't get my head around, really, I think is I'm not really into sort of swearing, you know, mm. in a song. I don't sort of, if there's no need for it to be there, I don't understand why you would do that. Do you know what I yeah. mean? You're writing down this this song, these lyrics, and I don't I don't understand why you would have to do that. It just, mm. Unless it's something that's warranted, you know, which I mm. suppose there's certain cases where it could be. But I just think if you've got the, the English language, it's so big it's so beautiful it's so vast why have you yeah. got a long yeah. anglo-saxon on us do you know what i mean you've only got three minutes song jesus man, it hard. yeah yeah i think th there's again sammy cohen goes on about this thing about singability of words yeah which is something i feel quite strongly about that uh, you know and i think i mentioned this in in last night's thing as well about um a song that, that keeps coming up on on spotify and it has the line in it, it it's called um, guitar case and it's a, this woman who's a songwriter talking about gigging basically and she sings singing my own songs and doing covers and I think covers is not a sort of it doesn't sound like a singable word to me it doesn't uh -huh. it doesn't sit right you know um, the other thing that I, I can't stand and I've probably mentioned this before is when people put the emphasis on the wrong syllable to make it fit the music and quite frequently the one that happens with most is the word guitar Right, because we all say guitar, but people often sing guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what the hell is that? <laughs> yeah, it's true. Actually. It's it's a weird one that. Um, but yeah. the, the 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 one that is probably the worst example for me is um, a Robert Cray album. Um, it's the title track of the album, and it's called Bad Influence. And <laughs> in order to get this to fit in the chorus, he sings. You're a bad influence, baby. 
Well, that, that makes it sound like she's given germs or something. You know, it, it's the wrong. It's the wrong emphasis. You know? And every time, and it, you know, he's a great, great musician, great blues player, writes good songs, but that one snuck through. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. <laughs> Sorry, mate. <laughs> But um, yeah, check that one out, um, and, and don't get me started on uh, the Serengeti, um, <laughs> which is my other, um, you know, the Toto song Africa. Mm-hmm. Mm. I know it. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> and they're all great musicians, and I mean the stuff, you know, the stuff they've done with uh, with Boss Gags is just fabulous. Anyway, moving swiftly on, before we start getting rude for phone calls coming through. <laughs> so, um, have you got any... Um, are you planning to record anything in the near future? Or, or, or are you just desperately waiting to get out there and do some more playing or what? What's, what's your... Reference? No, I want to record some new stuff, really. Um, mm. I, I, did, uh, I did some tour dates with Martin Stevenson and Martin was going right. to produce something we were going to go up to Glasgow in, and it was I think it was April mm. well I was going up there you lived up there um, April of the lockdown last year so that would have would have never worked anyway mm. um, and then I, I got a message off him the other day saying um, have I got anything down and recorded which I haven't because as you'll know mm. uh, with speaking to me before this went live uh, my technical ability to, I can just about work the TV remote control so, and if if the batteries went, it would take me about a week to realise what was wrong. Can I can I can I share with with our public the fact that you when you appeared online first tonight, you were on your side. Yes, I was. <laughs> well, so I, I was sitting here, and Steve <laughs> was approaching me head first, basically. <laughs> But um, uh, but, doesn't so make what, you a bad doesn't make you a bad person. Don't worry. Well, I know, but what it does do is it, it makes it difficult to record anything because I can't record anything at home because I just I just haven't got that um, wherewithal. So it means just getting back in the studio, which I will do, mm. um, and just getting uh, getting stuff together. But it, it feels I don't know if it's because of the the lockdown easing, but it feels you know when you, you'll know yourself when uh, when you're writing songs. I don't know. Don't know how what I would call it, but you you get something in you that you sort of know it's coming. You know that that something's happening. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, that's how yeah, it yeah. feels at the moment. So this this new song's sort of sprouting about a bit like yourself, though. You know, a, a chorus a, and a verse and a half here and a, a middle eight there. So yes. you, know. you see, as I say, like, I went through it the other day with some post-it notes and thought, right. I'll work my way through these now and try and transcribe them and do something with them. But yeah. I've only done three so far. Um, but what's what's your plan with it? Are you going to record it? And um, do, do you do you still see yourself as doing albums or CDs? Um, or, or? Well, yeah, I'd that, like to do that whole album. thing has changed a lot, hasn't it? It has, it has, and there's no money in it, is there at all? Um, yeah. But I like. I like having a body of work that you can look back on and say, you know, do you know, yeah. I remember that time. I remember that. I remember those people. And it's almost like a bit of a, a time machine for yourself to look back yeah. on. And so I quite like the idea of doing albums, even if they don't sell any, yeah. you know, just a box full. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> Got one somewhere around here. Uh, so, yeah, I'd like to do that, I think. Um, but it's just getting it all all together, really, isn't it? Mm. You know, I think, it, I mean, the, the... We've talked about this on a lot of occasions, and, and, and I think that because the technology has changed so much, I mean, you know, coming from, you know, this the early 70s where you had to have, you had to go into a studio. Yeah. In the 60s, you'd go into the studio, produce something, then you'd get it pressed, and then this. And then suddenly when the internet hit us, we'd already got to the point where we were able to record at home, mm. but now suddenly we could just put the stuff out there. Yeah. And it yeah. doesn't have to be an album full of stuff. You know, it can be a, a concept album of 47 songs if you want, or it can be <laughs> a, a, f- a 15 second tune. Yeah. Um, yeah, I get that. But I, I, do you not think, do you not feel, to me personally, I think it kind of, it's because it's become free, mm. it's become almost worthless, you know. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I think that people, I mean, 
I know, I, I don't know if I told you that uh, someone I work with, her, they bought her daughter a, a record player mm. and they went out and bought some albums from, mm. from Sainsbury's probably yeah. these days. And um, she put it on um, and she's 22, Georgia. Mm. And she put it on and she listened to about 30 seconds of the first song then she lifted it up and moved into the next one. And it's just... <laughs> Excellent. Do you know what uh, I mean though? Yeah. Well, um, I, I think I've probably asked, uh, I, this is a question I've asked lots of people. Um, is if you're using if you're using a, a CD player, do you ever use the shuffle button? Mm, yeah, and I know mo- you mean. most people most people over a certain age don't use it because yeah, we because think of that... an album as being an album. Yeah, absolutely, I totally agree. Because it, whoever it is that's putting that album out, I thought very sort of. You've wasted hours gonna... trying to work out with the order to put them in, and you have the audacity to shuffle <laughs> them. I, I'm not going to be guilty of that. that is, it's no. cruel. Yeah, it is. It is. That's, it is. That, that's shitting on somebody's cake, isn't it? Let's be fair. Oh, totally. It's, uh... <laughs> it is, though, isn't it? It's it's crazy, and uh... even you know, even though the the idea, even CDs are bad are bad enough in the sense though that even an album used to be a side A and a side B, didn't it? Yes. So you'd have your sort of five songs on say side A and your mm. five songs on say side B, and mm. you'd know what song six was going to be that was going to open side B. You mm. know, and so even songs with all like that, and then when, when CDs came along, it kind of almost took that away a little bit. Yeah, you know, yeah. but now obviously it's gone even further. And like well, said. there is some somebody explained this to me a couple of years ago that there is actually um, a difference when they when they're mastering things as well on vinyl. Um, the mastering, certainly in, in the uh, in, in the sixties and seventies, the the mastering for the outer tracks on vinyl is done slightly differently to the mastering on the inner. Tracks. Okay, and, I think I've and, heard that before. And to do with the the amount of bass in them, um, yeah, and how, how they contoured and things like that, uh, which I mean, you know, if you're putting out a 15 second hit, then it doesn't make any difference, really, does it? <laughs> but I, I I agree with you. I I find there's a um because people say, well, yeah, I'm putting out a single. I mean, yeah, you know, a lot of the young guys I work with, they say, mm. yeah, we're putting out a single next week, and I thought, well, w- what do you mean putting out a single? Yeah. You know, it's um, yeah, and and I like the I still like the idea that you have a as you say a, a body of songs that has some sort of structure to it. Yeah, not necessarily so, because... a theme, but but it, you know you've got four or five things in in a, in a certain order, and that's yeah. how they work. I think so. And if you're writing your own stuff, I think that if the songs are written around the same time, they, like you say, they don't necessarily have to have a theme, but. Mm. It's kind of a snapshot of your life, whether they're right or wrong. And you, mm. you might come back to them in 10 years and say, oh, God, I can't believe I said that. What was I thinking? But <laughs> you were thinking that at the time, you know. And yeah. It's, it's funny, almost like growing up I did, uh, I did an album three years ago, and um, I, I did, did it with a producer called Nigel Stone. Yeah. And I'd arranged to go in the studio with him. And my first thought I was going to do an EP length, which I still think is quite a weird thing to use these days because it's not the EP <laughs> anyway. Um, but I, I had five songs and uh, we went in the studio and it was going really well. And um, we, we hadn't actually finished them, but we'd, we'd, we'd laid the basic tracks down and we were starting to overdub certain things. And um, I was due to go on holiday for a couple of weeks. And um, I came home after sort of third day in the studio or something, and I said to Leslie, "This is going really well. I think I'm going to do an album, so I'm going to do ten songs for it." So during the the three weeks we were away, I had another five songs to complete. Came back and uh, and recorded them, and it, it sounds great. It's 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 a it's a decent body of work, and they do have a certain feel to them. But the interesting thing is that of those five songs I wrote, the second. I, there are very few of them that I ever play live. Right. And I'm not sure why that is. I, I, it's, it's not that they're not good songs, but I think that m- my tendency has been that I will re- write a song and then sort of road test it a bit and maybe modify it. And yeah, okay, well, maybe I'll drop the bridge. It doesn't need it. Or maybe yeah. it needs a bridge and add something to it. And after I've done a little bit of that and got the lyrics a bit more, you know, fitting together better um, in terms of phrasing and stuff, then I'm happy to record it. Whereas in this instance, they were written and recorded. Right. And they never got road tested. They just went <laughs> they went straight to the Grand Prix. Like. Yeah. Um, and I think that may be one of the reasons why I don't, they, they, haven't, they haven't grown on me really. 
Uh-huh. So, um, but they still, but they still do have that, as you say, they have like a sound from that period. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, it's good. It's uh, interesting stuff. Though. Okay, I think we should go for song number three. What do you reckon? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, this one, um, this uh, this is a song called um, "I've Been a Fool." Sorry, and uh, it's about. It's about somebody who meets up with someone via social media Mm. about 20 years later than they Mm. had a relationship and Mm. still holds a bit of a candle for them. And and the other person, they've just moved on with their life. They did all but forgotten this person Mm. who who would thought about them all the time. You know what I mean? Mm. It's quite sad. But um, I wrote it in Dumfries when I was on a guitar uh, and songwriting um, retreat of that, that was set up by Martin Stevenson. All right. Um, and um, we we all had to write a song in the day, in the two days we were there. And uh, I, I'm not very good at things like that. I'm not very good at deadlines and stuff. So mm. usually it takes me about six months. Um, <laughs> but it was good to be in that frame. But because I write solely for myself or on my own, mm. there was like... I couldn't, I, I needed to have a bit of a bridge between something I was doing. And there was a guy called uh, Steve uh, who said to me, just put an F in and put a G in. And, and I would have never done that. And I did, and it worked. It worked in a way that I would have never done it. And then I suddenly thought, oh, yeah, I suppose that does work. That's really good. And then there's a line in the song where it says, all my heartstrings have turned to rust. And originally it said, "Turn all my heartstrings have bust. And uh, a guy said to me, why don't you change that to um, mm. to rust? It sounds better than bust. And yeah, that was quite nice. So we were, there was no egos. Everyone was just yeah. there doing this songwriting together and, and we all performed them and it was brilliant. And mm. speaking about what we're speaking about with those 10 songs, whenever I play this song now, I, I can still see those 20 or so people that were there for the weekend. They're yeah. all part of the song, you know, and I, yeah. I love that. I think that's quite special. So. But it, it, coming back to the thing about singability, there is a the thing about the bust and rust is uh, that the, it's... it's, it's Bust is a is a very it's very hard consonant sound. Yeah. Isn't it? Whereas yeah. Rust, rust is a bit more flowing mm-hmm. somehow or other. Yeah. And maybe maybe so. that's that's part of the thing about singability of words. Yeah. It's um, just sometimes it's difficult for you to see to see that you know, hmm. um, or or when you're in the, in the middle of it when it's hmm. all going round and you, 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 sometimes I'm, I don't know maybe I'm a bit um, maybe I don't actually sort of think about the songwriting process of the words enough you know mm. once i've got what i need to say then i'm, I'm so sort of happy with it but it proved to me that time that it can be done you know mm. can be so polished good. yeah no that's good and, and, and it's a nice example that because bust, bust yeah. is, is, is is fine but rust is just better <laughs> so much better yeah mm. <laughs> i hope nice you're not one. watching <laughs> Moon 
just watches while I'm playing murder in the dark. Once was a flame, now barely a spark. Call out your name. It's lonely and dark. Where well, I've been wishing on a star. It burned out years ago. What can I do with my hands? I've got no touch to hold. I've been a fool. Making me feel this too. All my memories are dust. Cause it's me instead of us. What can I do with my heart? All the strings of brass. I've been a fool. Making me feel this too. Hoping you feel this too. Why didn't you feel this too? Excellent, excellent. We've got a comment here from Ian Scanlon who says, The F to G works really well, Steve. Top tune ah, and voice. Thanks, Ian. Nice to know you again, mate. Ian's uh, a great guitar player, by the way. Is he? Oh, he's Thank fantastic. Yeah. Is he from around this neck of the woods? He's from Manchester originally. He's in a band called Rain Tree County that were absolutely brilliant. Oh, and, right. um, he lives in, um, oh, God, what's it called? Witness. No, Winsford. Winsford. <laughs> Slight difference. I know. <laughs> there were so many cars in Witness, I imagine. <laughs> Not that I've got anything against Witness. Um, but um, they're quite different places. The um, Yeah, nice song. I like that a lot. I like a lot. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a bit of angst in there, isn't there? You're like, oh, I've, I've been a fool line is a good Yeah, one. I think so. It was kind of Go like, on. yeah, because, and you do get that, don't you? There's all sorts of, Hmm. stories of people kind of it's just really sort of sad that you know one person go through all their life thinking they have had this magical thing hmm. with somebody and the other person can't remember who they are or whatever you know <laughs> i don't know, imagine well biz bizarrely the, the song i did tonight is is um a, a, a parallel situation it actually it wasn't something that happened to me but a, a friend of mine told me a story about how he'd um, met somebody at a, at a wedding and um I'd had a, uh, should we say, a torrid 24 hours with her. And um, <laughs> then she, she was going back to the States. And, um, and they, they, you know, it was just something special sort of thing. And, um, and I, I wrote a song about that. And the song I did today was one day I was thinking, well, what, happened, what would happen if they actually got together again? And now, and, you know, what would have happened then? So it was, an, that was chapter two sort of, yeah, thing, of yeah, the yeah. same story. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, it's fun. So, listen, I know that you're going to have to dash off quickly to do your uh, parental duties. So, um, do you want to do one more song? Okay, that's all right. Yeah, fine, yeah, fine. I'm enjoying it. I mean, Howard, Howard Fisher has said, do we know Howard Fisher? I know Howard, yeah. You're right, it says, uh, nice, relaxed interview, and you're sounding great, Steve. Oh, cheers, Howard. Howard's great as well. He's a good guitar player. He's got a Rick and Bucket. <laughs> that says it all. <laughs> yeah, every you see him in the, in the neighborhood, everyone goes like, "There's Howard the Rickenbacker," you know. <laughs> like some sort of gangster, Jimmy the Thumbs. <laughs> Jimmy the Thumbs. <laughs> Um, he will, right. If I ever meet him, he will be Howard the Rickenbacker now. <laughs> I'm sure he will be. I'll finish with a love song then. Okay. Um, for people that are in love, it looks great. <laughs> Do you stop and ever start to think what could have been? Shifting shapes of time and reverie. Holding on to something that is gone. Holding on. Do you dream? Of all the things that you could not translate Of everything that made you hesitate Feelings that we long to navigate Holding on 
Cause in you I see everything I long to be from the day you turn to me. Something in me changed. In you I claim making sense of it. Sings a song for me. Do you float? Above the city streets to guide your home. A mess of shining stars, your chaperone. Ghosting through this beauty all alone. Holding on. Cause in you I see everything I long. What a long drive that was again. Inside of me, something in me changed. In you, I cling, making sense of everything. Smile, girl, in my heart, it sings, sings a song for me. Excellent. Cheers. Excellent. I uh, Sorry, a little, little bit of technical confusion there because suddenly the comments started appearing on the screen, which I don't know why that happened. Yeah, I just sorry. And it, <laughs> yes, because Ian, Ian had just said um, Winsford, Alabama. Steve. Yeah, it threw me a bit that. <laughs> is that genuine? That it is Winsford, Alabama, is it? I, well, I used to drive home from there, so I don't think so. No, it's probably not. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, Although, who knows? He's Being in the States years, years ago, years and years ago, and, and um, being completely lost in Newark, which is not a good place to be lost in. <laughs> and uh, a, guy, a guy helped me out and he said, um, uh, where, are you, where are you guys from? And I said, um, Manchester. And he went, Manchester, New York State. Because I didn't <laughs> realise at that time that there is a Manchester in New York State. And I said, no, Manchester, Great Britain. And he went, Hmm. Oh shit! I walk <laughs> oh, I walked off. <laughs> no, that was the entire conversation. <laughs> Brilliant, excellent, Steve. It's been an absolute, absolute joy to talk to you tonight. Mate. It's been very enjoyable and great songs. Keep doing. Can I just apologise uh, for my moving about. I'm, I'm having a hernia operation. It's absolutely oh. murdering. So I've been like this all night. <laughs> People have been like, "What the hell's wrong with him?" So, but no, I've really enjoyed it, Roland. As always, it's been brilliant. And you've done it through that. I mean, it, it, you seem to have been doomed on this show because the, the, the first time you weren't well, the yeah. second time you get called into hospital, the third time yeah. you're having a hurt. Oh, dear God. Yeah, I've got to go in. I've got to go yeah. next week for me. Uh, thank oh, you. But yeah. Well, best well, that's of luck with it, mate. You know, I've not got some sort of worms or something. It's just... <laughs> I'm sure nobody thought you had worms. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh great we've had lots of nice comments in um, oh good people people reading re um, yeah mm, I love the tunes mm, yeah wonderful yeah everybody's enjoyed it anyway and I know oh. I certainly have so it's been an absolute pleasure Steve and um, um, well keep in touch keep doing yeah. it and uh, keep writing because you've written some great stuff and I'm sure you'll write some more great songs as well oh thanks Roland nice one mate thanks a lot cheers, cheers. Oh. Gosh, that was good. I thoroughly enjoy that. Um, so that's all from me for this week. And um, uh, we'll be back again next week. Bit of a surprise next week. Um, that's because I don't know what's happening. No, it, there is, it will be a little bit of a surprise. Um, PJ Kirk, what rhymes with worms? Terms. Is that any good? 
Um, what else can we have with the rhymes with worms? Churns, you can get away with churns, I would have thought. Oh, Sammy Khan would have. Maybe I can't. So, thanks, guys. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Thanks for your comments. Um, and thanks for you, Ian, for um, calling in from somewhere else in the universe. And, um, yeah, come back and see us again soon. And so, for now, that's it. Thanks, guys. Take care and stay safe. Bye.